Hi, welcome back. In this video, we'll cover indexed views, which are commonly referred to as materialized views. Hopefully, some of you guys are already familiar with indexes and how they work. To keep it short and simple, an index is a special object that provides fast data retrieval at the cost of maintaining it. There are different types of indexes we can use in SQL Server, each with their own distinct characteristics. In this video, we'll only focus on the clustered and the non-clustered indexes. As we've seen in the previous videos, a normal view is basically a select statement. Once it's queried, the select statement is executed and data is retrieved from the underlying tables, after which it's processed. Reading the data can be one of the costliest processes of querying a view. To retrieve the data from the underlying tables, SQL Server needs to read the data pages of each underlying table that contains the qualifying data. This can cause a lot of logic and or physical reads, which is bad for query performance. Ideally, when you query data from a database, you want to have the least possible number of reads, especially if the view processes a lot of data for reporting. This is where the indexed views come in. By creating a clustered index on a view, the data from the underlying tables are automatically processed and stored in the index. Instead of reading the data pages of the underlying tables, SQL Server then simply reads the data pages from the clustered index created on the view. As a result, the number of reads is heavily reduced, thus increasing the performance of select statements against the view. Indexes created on views can also be beneficial for queries that do not specifically target the view. Those benefits come at an expensive cost. Indexes generally need to be maintained so that SQL Server can efficiently and effectively use their indexes when querying data if the data in the underlying table changes. Those changes will be automatically computed according to the definition of the view and will be stored in the clustered index and non-clustered indexes if we have any. So basically, every time we perform DML operations on the underlying tables, SQL Server has to make sure that these changes are also reflected in the indexes of the view. This is a very costly process that degrades the performance of DML operations, which is why it's important that you carefully assess whether an indexed view is an appropriate solution you're looking for. If you have tables that undergo many transactions per second, creating indexed views on these tables will only degrade the overall performance of the system. But in reporting environments where data modifications is less likely to happen or happens periodically, indexed views can result in faster analysis, thus improving the overall performance of the system. Just like tables, views can only have one clustered index and several non-clustered indexes. However, to create non-clustered indexes on a view, the view must already contain a clustered index. Let's head over to SQL Server Management Studio to start with the creation of indexed views. Here we have the definition of a new view we will create. This view will display all the products of which the quantity in stock is less than 10. To create an index on this view, we need to include the schema binding attribute. This is to prevent schema changes of the underlying objects being referenced by the view. The schema binding attribute is not the only requirement for creating an index on a view. To look at the other requirements, we will head over to the official documentation of indexed views. In this online documentation, you'll be able to find almost any information regarding the creation of index views. We will not cover all the requirements in this video, but there are a few I would like to emphasize. First, we have the required set options for index views. Normally, these options already have the required values needed to create index views. However, when using these APIs, you must adjust the values of these options to the required values. Otherwise, you won't be able to create index views. Next, we see that the view needs to be deterministic. This depends on the expression formed in the view and the functions being referenced by the view. An object is deterministic if it always returns the same result set when it's called with the same set of input values. So, if all the expressions and functions in the view are deterministic, then the view is also considered deterministic. The documentation also further explains a way to check the determination of the columns in a view. Then we have additional requirements. First, we see that only the owner of the view can create an index on the view. Next, we see that the objects being referenced by the view are required to be referenced using the two-part naming convention, which includes the name of the schema and the object. Then we have the schema binding attribute, the view itself, and any function being referenced by the view are required to be created with this attribute. In the following section, we have the transact SQL elements, which are not allowed in any indexed view. We, for example, have the count function, the outer joins, 
derive tables, the distinct clause, and the list goes on. Also, when we have a group by clause in a view, we need to include the count big function in the select statement of the view. Otherwise, the creation of the index will fail. We'll look at this later on in the video. Let's head back over to SQL Server Management Studio and create the low stock product view. If we execute this DDL script, the view will be created. Before we query the view, there are two things we need to do to analyze the increased performance we get by creating an index on the view. First, we'll turn on the Statistics I.O. option. This will, among other things, return the number of logical and physical reads needed to complete the query. Then we will enable the actual execution plan so we can see what happens behind the scenes when we query the view. If we execute the query, you'll see a new tab appearing at the bottom. This is where the actual execution plan is graphically presented. One of the first things you'll be able to notice is that if we query the view, we're basically querying three tables. We have the store table, the stock table, and the product table. These are the underlying tables we've specified in the select statement of the view. If we head over to the messages tab, you'll see that we have 208 logical reads along with one physical read from the product tables, nine logical reads along with one physical read from the stock table, and finally two logical reads along with one physical read from the store table. Let's go ahead and create a unique clustered index on the store ID and the product ID column of the view. Let's query the view again. If we now look at the execution plan, you'll notice it remains the same. So SQL Server did not use the clustered index we created on the view. The reason lies behind the addition of SQL Server I'm using, which is the developer edition. This is a limitation in all the non-enterprise editions of SQL Server. If you're using the Enterprise Edition of SQL Server, the optimizer will automatically use the clustered index or any other indexes created on the view. To force the optimizer to use the indexes created on the view in the non-Enterprise Editions of SQL Server, we need to include the no expand table hint in the select statement. If we now execute the query and look at the execution plan, you'll notice that we're now queried only one object. This is the clustered index we created on the view. If we head over to the Message tab, you'll see that SQL Server accessed only one object and performed as little as three logical reads along with one physical read to retrieve the data. This is a vast improvement over the normal view. To better see this improvement, we will execute both queries simultaneously, one where the index is not used and one where the index is used. If we head over to the execution plan, you'll notice that the first query, which is the query where the index is not used, has a query cost of 92%, while the second query, which uses the clustered index, has a significantly lower query cost of 8%. If we head over to the Messages tab, you'll also be able to see the improvement in the number of logical reads performed for both queries. At this point, you'll notice that no physical reads were performed. That's because the data pages containing the data for both queries were already loaded into memory when we first executed the queries. So SQL Server no longer has to get them from disk. It can now simply access them from memory. Aside from creating a clustered index on a view, we can also create non-clustered indexes. However, non-clustered indexes can only be created on a view that already has a clustered index. With this DDL script, we'll create a non-clustered index on the name column of the view. If we execute this query, the non-clustered index will be created. I already have a query written that specifically targets the non-clustered index. If we execute this query and head over to the execution plan, you'll see that we're now querying only the non-clustered index. So we've now created both the clustered and the non-clustered index on a view. Just like with tables, a view can only have one clustered index and a bunch of non-clustered indexes. The more indexes you create, the more indexes that'll need to be maintained which will cause slower DML operations against the underlying tables. In the next example, we'll look at a view that contains a group by clause. This view will display the total quantity sold for each product and the total revenue made for each product. If we execute this DDL script, the view will be created. If we now try to create a clustered index on this view, we will get the following error. This error states that we cannot create an index on this view because its select list does not include proper use of the count big function. This is one of the requirements we saw in the online documentation of index views. If we have a group by clause in the select statement of a view, the select statement must also contain the count big function. Otherwise, you'll get the same error I just received. So, to fix this, we have to include the count big function in the select list of the product performance view because we're performing aggregations based on each product in the order item table. 
the count big function will simply return the total number of orders for each product. Since the view is already created, we will need to alter it to change its definition. If we now try to create the clustered index again, you'll notice that the statement completed successfully. Let's go ahead and query the view. Before we look at the result, we'll execute these queries a few times so we can have the data pages containing the requested data loaded into memory. This will cause only logical reads to be performed. If we head over to the execution plan, you'll notice that the first query has a cost of 100%. This is the execution plan of the query that did not use the clustered index we created on the view. As a result, data is read from both the order item table and the product table. If we look at the second execution plan, you'll notice that the clustered index is effectively used. Instead of having to read data from the underlying base tables, data is only read from the clustered index we created on the view, and thus improving the performance of select statements against the view. Let's head over to the Messages tab to look at the I.O. performance of both queries. As you can see, the second query has significantly lower logical reads than the first one where the index is not used. So in this video, we started off with a normal view. We've then looked at improving data retrieval operations against views by creating indexes on them. As we've seen during the video, the improved performance came as a result of significantly fewer reads being performed because we were no longer querying the underlying tables, but simply returning the data from the index. The improved performance of data retrieval operations comes at an expense of cost. DML operations against the underlying tables will take longer to complete because the indexes need to be maintained. This should be taken into consideration when you create indexes on a view. We've now covered the objectives for this lecture. In the next video, we will cover partitioned views. Thank you for watching. See you then.